Hi. Good evening um, in our time zone, um, but it may be morning, and it certainly is in, uh, morning in a few of our other guests' time zones. Um, and I will introduce you shortly. My name is Mia Bays, and I run Bird's Eye View, and our mission is 17 years young. And our mission is to bring ever greater audiences to films by women. Uh, and it's all about the perspective. So it's films that are written by women, directed by women, or based on a book or a story or a life of a woman. Um, and the name of that mission is Reclaim the Frame. So we see ourselves as cultural activists and we partner on new films and classic film releases and we invest in the releases of those films. So Love Child, uh, and the conversation we're about to, um, the film we're going to talk about shortly um, is a, a film that we have invested in the release of um, because feminism is also about economics and so bringing greater, ever greater audiences to see films by women is an incredibly important part of widening the perspective of not just film but of the world and we all need to connect more than ever at the moment because of what we're all going through. Um, so it's lovely to actually, we're connecting several continents here. Um, so I would like to welcome Leila Masali, who's a protagonist of Love Child, um, which is, for those of you who are watching have seen the film, is a tender and incredibly moving film made over five years. So Leila Masali, welcoming you from Turkey. Um, Eva Marvad, who is the director, who are, we are welcoming from Denmark. And Tara Safari Far, who works at Human Rights Watch and is um, and works in Washington DC, but is joining us from Mexico City. So I would first like to say welcome to everyone and go around um, the group and ask how everyone is. So first of all, you all, Leila, how are you? Thanks so much. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, it's uh, night now in Turkey and. Uh, we are okay, as all the other countries, we're struggling with the pandemic. Thank you. And Eva, how are you? How is Denmark at this time? Denmark is all right, and I'm all right. Just, uh, it's nighttime. My son is eating a pizza just uh, next to me here. And um, we just came flying in from picking up, up something in the in town. So um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy I made it. Wonderful, thank you. And Tara, last but not least. Uh, thank you, I, I'm doing okay. I'm really grateful for the nice weather in Mexico City. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the event. Wonderful. Tara, actually, um, on that note, can you maybe tell us, just because I've obviously introduced Layla is the protagonist, Eva is, a filmmaker and just to talk a little bit about your just to contextualize your participation in this panel panel let's just hear a little bit more about human rights watch and the work that you do um so i work for an international organization called human rights watch we investigate violations of human rights in more than 90 countries around the world um and my role is to investigate the violations of human rights in iran so I'll, I am an Iranian, I was born and raised in Iran, and I continue to focus on documenting the violations of human rights that take place in Iran, including um, different legal frameworks that discriminate against women and, and other minorities, as well as practices of the authorities that violate um, legitimate freedoms um, in, in, in different places. Wonderful, thank you, Tara. Um, so Eva, let's start with you. So how did your involvement um, in the lives of Layla and Sahand um, com commence and, and how did this film come about? Well, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I've been doing films for 20 years. Uh, so I'm always looking for a good uh, real life story. Um, and in this case, there was a Danish uh, director who had uh, who knew uh, Leila and Sahan, especially Sahan, from uh, meeting in, uh, in in Iran. And they had chatted in the bazaar, I guess, for, for some of you who have seen the film, you know that Sahan was also working for the Secret Service and I think he had a job of, of actually talking to um, tourists in the bazaar and, and getting to know them and report on them. But he became friendly with this Danish man, Morten, and when uh, Leila and Sahan decided to 
to escape from Iran, they felt that they uh, needed some witnesses, some somebody to follow them, and that would uh, enhance their security. So they called up uh, this director and asked him if he would um, follow their story. And so he did for a year, but he's not super experienced in these long-term documentary films. So he couldn't finance the film and he came to my office and screened some uh, footage that he had with Leila and Sahan. And um, there I saw a very um, charming couple of people uh, on, in a very difficult situation. And uh, I got interested in trying to see uh, in which way we could work with this uh, kind of small love story that held a bigger perspective of, of uh, the refugee crisis, but told from a very uh, little um, angle, we could maybe get a bigger picture. And Leila, obviously we watch you experiencing an enormous amount of very big emotional moments and 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 points of life that you really don't know how they're going to turn out and and all of this time you have a camera on you how what, what did that did that heighten the experience or did you forget about it what was the experience of actually knowing this was also being documented and you were going to watch it back how was that how did that feel okay uh I, I, I was born in Iran, and Iran, in Iran, in our culture, it's very difficult to be in front of the camera and be uh, very honest to say, uh, uh, to speak about the very details, I mean, about the very secret details of, uh, of your uh, life. And uh, uh, no, yes, we have a very good actress, but I wasn't actress, I was a one normal one. And uh, at the beginning, it was very hard for me to be in, uh, to be in front of the camera and I speak about my details, my very private life. And uh, but I saw that I have no the other choice. I should know the other choice. I should speak. I should uh, send my voice to someone. Uh, and that time, I didn't even had any hope that somebody once in the world can hear me. And uh, from one from one hand. Uh, I wish that somebody can hear me. At the other hand, I wish that uh, it, the film uh, do not spread all over the world because uh, Tara knows that it, it's very difficult for uh, Iranian to be in public and they speak about the, their private life. And the case that I have experienced is something forbidden. It's very something a taboo in my country. And in the beginning, it was very hard. But as I, as uh, as the ch time passing, I understand I have no the other choice. I uh, then I started to stare to the camera and uh, speak frankly. Wonderful, thank you. And Eva, I mean, part of the filming experience was also on the part of Sahand. It was also about safety as well, wasn't it? It was about documenting something in order to have a witness. So can you talk a little bit about kind of that? Um, I mean, maybe Layla also after, after Eva. Of the safety of the family? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think to me, uh, I mean, it's probably better to ask Leila and Tara because they know the Iranian society much better than I do. But it was very clear for me um, from the beginning that uh, what I took as normal was not normal to Leila and Sahan because they had they were had lived in a country where um, the government could do all kind of things to you without um, them held, being held responsible. Um, so I had to try and figure out uh, with their help. Uh, how we could do a film that would not put their safety in danger. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we also had a lot of discussions that the fact that you are being filmed and that somebody um, keeps an eye on you can also um, make you feel more safe. Um, and as you see in the film, Leila and Sahan, they go into the Iranian consulate in, in Istanbul and they uh, have done that uh, with the camera. And also, in after I left them, they also sometimes has gone to the to the consulate. And every time Sahan he texts me, so that he knows that somebody knows where he's going. 
because I think that that kind of I don't really because um, I haven't lived it, but I can understand that that kind of fear is real, and that you can actually disappear um, without anybody knowing where you are, and um, and that is of course uh, it's not paranoia; it's a real um, uh, threat. Mm -hmm. Tara, can we maybe bring you in um, to maybe respond to some of those points and uh, around, particularly around identity and, and the differences between sharing your story and, and the cultural barriers and quite rightly fears around safety? Sure. I mean, I think what's incredible about this movie is that it's a very personal story that um, brings a lot of different elements of the society into it. I think uh, what we're talking about is um, is a is a story very personal, um, but um, also the impact of a problematic legal framework um, that criminalizes um, criminalizes um, privacy rights and puts people at extreme danger, the, the, the threat of life. Um, so you have the legal framework that doesn't that, that not only does not protect you, it can also be a threat to you in this context. And then you have all the different cultural barriers um, that can that can also um, put you at harm. Um, and I think depending on where you are um, coming from in the society, in terms of uh, cultural and socioeconomic background and demographic. Um, the amount of safety that you could create for yourself inside the country varies. If you have a family that is very supportive of open, of accepting you as who you are and the way you want to live, uh, you have a much better chance of finding a way to find safety in the country. Um, but if you are dealing with a society or an env a societal environment that's not accepting of that, and in most cases that is the case, um, then you can't also feel safe around people who are your closest ones. Um, so coming out with that story, you have different layers of concern, ranges from authorities and their legal power to authorities and their perception and judgment about who you are uh, and them using their, their position of power to, to, to do harm to you or take advantage of your vulnerable position for other abusers, as we see that the way the, the couple is tried, to, is being pressured to concede because of the quote unquote secret on them. And two, um, the judgment you can receive from your loved ones, your neighbors, the community you grew up in. So it's an extremely complex. Uh, um, issue to navigate as an individual, um, both as a man and a woman, and I think um, Leila can, can speak more into that. It's not easy. The emotional toll of finding the place that you're comfortable, telling your story and feeling safe, um, while you're still going through this experience of being a refugee and in a country that's not necessarily accepting you, in a process that you still haven't reached, reached where you feel settled and safe, I can only imagine how, how emotional and how complex it is to find that, that space to speak. Leila and Eva, you were both nodding a lot, and Tara, thank you for sharing. You, you said a lot of really wonderful, valuable stuff there to, that we should expand on, I think, perhaps. Leila, do you want to actually respond to some of what Tara said? Uh, you know, uh, Sahan uh, was arrested, uh, had been arrested by Ministry of Intelligence when he was young. And uh, I, he always tell me, uh, to, uh, tell me that when I was in the prison, uh, they sent him to the prison. Uh, and, uh, and he said that on that time, just you know, I imagined that if I had a chance to call someone, to speak with someone, to uh, say that, okay, I am in danger or I am here, that somebody at least understand that I am where I am, okay? And just when he feels that, he felt that we are in danger, he has started to send, to collect some documents to show that as evidence to prove that, that we are in the, uh, danger. And uh, as Tara said, uh, from one part, you know, uh, sometimes I say to myself, how poor you are, Leila. 
that from one side you give to yourself that you say to yourself that yes you are right but from the other uh, part you want to prove to as parasites to even to the closest one to prove that i was right i didn't have no the other choice but uh, you are still worried about the criticize you are still worried about uh, the criticize of the society and you are a woman that uh, you want to be a role model for your son also you are in the complex and you are in the paradox okay uh, and it's uh, when you come uh, and choose uh, choose a way as being a refugee then you see even here also the old barriers the old wars are in front of you and you feel yourself okay what was the wrong what was the, what was my fault am i okay everybody if if it was a mistake okay everybody uh, once upon a day in life they can do the mistake even i can i don't want to accept that it was a mistake i had no the other first i did my best in my life in my own life now thank you leila and eva can i ask you to pick up on any of the points that tara or leila just um laid out yeah i think for me personally it's been um very interesting to to come to understand uh, how much it means when you've been raised in a culture like like the Iranian culture, um, and how how um, how it influences uh, what you can say and what you can't say. Because I was in the beginning when I met Leila and Sahan, I was trying to get them to tell uh, the backstory, uh, what happened to them, and I just you know straightforward. In my country, it's not so rare that you kind of divorce someone and you have a kid with a new guy. I mean, to me, it's no big deal. But um, but to understand the depth of uh, these cultural um, no-goes and how it influences language and how it influences your own way of per perceiving yourself and your possibilities, um, I think it's it's uh, it was uh, very moving for me when we came to the psychologist that you also meet in the film who was actually able to talk to Leila and Sahan in a way, and especially Leila um, delivers very beautifully uh, her backstory in that room, uh, which I was not able to get her to tell me in the same uh, sincere and beautiful way. And um, I think it's very brave what you do, Leila. It's it's uh, you, you raise a voice that is uh, that I have come to understand how difficult it must have been for you to actually tell these stories. Uh, and I didn't know that in the beginning when we started working. You know, I believe that what I have done. Okay, I don't say I am a very brave one. I am a very unique one. No, I am not. I am one very normal one from that society. But I'm sure that what I have experienced now will be very, uh, very, very normal in the future as your country. And what I suffer now, uh, it's just because of the time, because of the time, because of the uh, geographical problems that I, that, uh, but in the future, it may be in 20 years, the problem that I suffered, that I still in suffering will be normal. And it's very heartbreaking for me that after somehow, but from one the other hand, it's very good. I say that, okay, it's gonna be normal for the future, for the women, because I know many women in country, in my country, that they have many problems. They're gonna divorce, they're gonna have it, their life, they're gonna establish the new life, but the, uh, the rule regulations is very tough and they, they have no the other choice, just is, uh, sticking on that situation and the struggle without going forward. They accept uh, they accept their fate, but I couldn't accept it. I wanted to fight with my fate. Mm -hmm. That's why you are brave. You no, are. <laughs> um, Tara, can I bring you in here to, to respond or expand to, to on some of those points, actually? I mean, I think um, the cultural issue is important um, and it shouldn't be discounted. Um, we are, um, we're, again, we are being impacted by the culture 
um, we are surrounded, we're limited in so many ways by the culture that is surrounding us. And it shapes our understanding of what constitute quote unquote right and wrong. Um, and, and in the context of Iran, I think the laws um, to many extent do not um, increase protection for people when it comes to some of these cultural issues. It, it, it can do more harm, it can, it can provide more restrictions. But I think what has been interesting to me in the context of Iran and, and is that legal reform has been very, very slow on, on women's rights front in general and social issues. As a matter of fact, um, in many instances, authorities use social restriction as a repression tactic. Um, for example, when it comes to mandatory um, the job um, of covering your your hair and so on. If they they actually even have a political angle. But what uh, it's similarly with extramarital um, relationship, but relationship out of the wedlock, all sorts of that. They're very limiting, and there's there's not that many. Um, there's no prospect of legal reform happening anytime soon. But what has been happening? on the cultural front has been very interesting because in the absence of um, this conversation being followed in the legal arena, people are living their life and pushing through the boundaries and the society is evolving. Um, of course, there's more harm in the absence of um, legal protection, but the society is evolving and is accepting what Leila is describing as I hope um, her, has her hope of things being acceptable and normal, it is happening on so many cultural fronts um, mm -hmm. that even though at the formal discourse, um, these are still forbidden, on the text of the law, they're still criminalized, um, people are finding a way to communicate um, um, uh, in the informal space. And the cult, as a result, the culture is evolving and people are talking to each other about these issues. It's, it's things that were normal or acceptable um, two decades ago are becoming more acceptable. Um, and so I think it's, it's always been really interesting for me to see that how the culture is, is evolving and is being influenced internally and externally. Um, and I think it's an important point to raise that you can't box the society and culture because ultimately culture is compromise, uh, compromise, compromised of the people who are going to demand um, their rights. As Leila was saying, not everyone is going to accept their faith. Many might choose to change it. And to, by changing their own faith, they're also contributing to the cultural change. And, and and that makes the, the legal reform even more necessary for, for protection and recognition. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you, Tara. Let's go back to the film. So Eva, what, what were some of the biggest challenges? I mean, what I find extraordinary is the intimacy with which you film. I just, it's staggering to me some of the scenes that you had a camera there for. <laughs> And and also, yeah, that how 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 drain how much how intense that must have been as a as a filmmaking experience because it's over a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, um, to do a, a good documentary film, you often have to spend long time with people because our life is not intense. Like we can't just film somebody for two weeks and then we have a drama. So. Um, I think what, what we kind of understood uh, early on in the process of filming was that Leila and Sahan, they were not shy in front of the camera. They were very likable and they were uh, very transparent in showing their emotions. Um, and uh, I think it might also be a, a Iranian Persian thing that you actually are very expressive um, in opposite to the Nordic countries where I live. We, we kind of hide ourselves more. Um, but at least that was um, something that, that is very useful for me because um, um, I think this story, was the intention was to kind of humanize the discussion about refugees and, and it's a very simple, almost naive point saying, well, refugees, they are people like you and me and it's not one big group looking the same, thinking the same. Um, because this actually, this uh, spe specific family are kind of uh, well-educated, 
they come out with money in their pockets. They don't live in a refugee camp. And we had the discussion whether that was too luxurious to kind of uh, portray um, a um, refugee case uh, because there's so many more dramatic stories out there that you might uh, say that they should have uh, the show and not this case. But I thought that exactly this family, they were very good at um, making me think that that could have been me. And I think that's very important. I was, I mean, we've been seeing a lot of the refugee issues uh, displayed throughout uh, the past uh, six, seven years. And when you see the same news repeating and repeating over again, and nobody does anything about it, the politicians kind of tend not to want to take any action or responsibility. Then as an audience, you can kind of grow numb. You don't, you can't take it anymore. You don't want to hear it anymore because it's the same misery repeating. And to me, I thought it would be interesting and, and important to re-empathize uh, with the refugee kind of, uh, and, and that, to, to that, uh, to, to meet that, to go for that goal, I think this family was good uh, because they reminded me in their, their quarrels in the couples, uh, how they could um, be very sweet and generous to their kid. I mean, it's all things that happens in my house as well. I also fight with my boyfriend and I'm also trying to do the best for my son. and. So in these very universal human aspects, I thought that this specific couple were very good at actually letting us in on that, so that the refugee uh, issue was kind of uh, wrapped in um, a beautiful love story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in terms of access, how did you, how know, did you know when to film? Was it sometimes, were you tipped off um, when there were kind of, you, news was being anticipated because five years is a long time to film and, and you yeah. don't always know when the big moments are going to happen. So talk us through that. No, and, and we live uh, three hours plane, plane flight from each other. So we had to um, to plan a bit. I mean, what we did was that we, uh, we thought that we wanted uh, the film to be very organic, to have the feel that we were actually there at the right times and that the life of Leyland Sahan should not be like uh, compressed into something that fitted the film team. So we were three directors, all from Denmark and one local DOP, a wonderful Turkish uh, woman uh, filming sometimes for us. So we had like a flexibility within the team. So we, and Leyland Sahan, they were super disciplined uh, in telling us when something new happened in their case. Uh, so we followed the, the case, uh, that the asylum case with the UNHCR, where the family um, for many, many years has been called sometimes into interviews or gotten updates from, from the UNHCR on these kind of devices, internet, telephones. Um, so whenever something new in the case happened, we would decide to go to Turkey and follow that. And that is kind of the drive or the motor of the film. And at the same time, when we went to Turkey, to do that, we would also keep an eye on the personal story, like um, Leila and Sahan's relationship. They didn't live together so before they came out of uh, Iran, so that was kind of a development of a, of a relationship. And we also followed Mani, of course, their son, um, growing up um, and adapting to the new realities. Great, thank you. And Leila, where, where there must have been points when you really thought, "I can't, I need the camera to, to be switched off." I mean, how did how did that feel? Were there moments, or did you just forget? I knew that. Uh, you mean that when the film is over? Yes, when the film no, finished. During, yeah? No, while while actually, because you were filmed over five years. Were there points when the scenes, what, what was happening was so intimate that you felt that you didn't want it, the camera to be there? Uh, as I told you, I wanted to be, to have the camera from one hand, but from the other hand, I was really worried about having the camera in my life too. I knew that it's gonna scream. And uh, now these days, uh, half of my mind is just, it's busy with what's going to happen at the end of this screening because first, okay, it was in the US, okay, <laughs> I said that it's far from here. 
maybe nobody can see it, maybe nobody from Iran can access it, but then on and on it goes around the world. And uh, some days ago, Money by Song was checking uh, one of the comments in the internet. You know, uh, my journey uh, didn't finish, and it's still everybody speaks about the five day, five years in the film. But I am here for nine years, and I don't know that how long it's gonna be. Uh, and, and my uh, now. Um, my new journey is started to uh, handle my son's emotion. I mean, to, uh, to keep him calm because he is a teen. He doesn't know all. Yes, we spoke with him. We saw. We spoke with. Uh, we gave him some details about our private life. But uh, you know that in that age, in the age of puberty, they are much more sensitive. And now he's started to reading the comments, and some comments are very harming. I mean, they, they have, they, I understand there is a kind of hate, hatred in their uh, comments, but surely uh, most of the comments are, are giving us a good energy. But among them, yes, we can see some of them. And then uh, he's very logic. He said that I know, mom. I knew what kind of life you had in Iran. I was a little, but I, I was evidence. I, I saw what happened to you on those days. I remember those days. And my journey is still going, and I'm not sure that what's going to happen in the future, in the coming days. But it's, it's very challenging. And, uh, and uh, when I came here, I was 32, and uh, now I, uh, some days ago, I turned to 40. And sometimes, you know, uh, I just sometimes these days is uh, thinking about that. Okay, I was a woman who could, yes, my English is not good, but at least could uh, speak English a bit. I had an opportunity of, uh, I mean, I was a very challenging one. I could survive. I could find a job. I could come out i have it even have it, this opportunity to come out from that uh, condition yes here is still unsafe for me turkey has just one border to iran it, but i still i'm out of that uh, danger a bit and then i'm just thinking about all the other women that they don't have any opportunity to speak about their stories and when i see that i Say this, I mean, this story is repeated. I screamed, I uh, let uh, Eva film our life, but uh, still, sometimes I see that, okay, where is, where is the human right? And then it comes, it's, it comes to me like a big question mark. And then I say that, okay, I done whatever that I could, but, uh, I can't see a, any response. But then, from the other hand, I see that the, yes, people show their empathy, and I say that, okay, even I couldn't find anywhere as a safe place for my family, but somebody could understand what happened for me or give the right to me, it's good. Thank you, Leila, for sharing that. Um, I mean, Tara and Eva, I mean, what this film really, as someone who is native to London and the UK, um, what this film is a really important and stark reminder of is the small, the, the freedoms that we, that I take for granted, just I take for granted as a, as a European, well, we're about to, yeah, well, that's another story, the UK and Europe, but anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the freedom of, the freedom of our culture and the freedom of, of living. I'm also a love child. I, I was born out of wedlock and met quite a long time ago. And, and you know, I would never, um, my, my parents never had to suffer what you have to suffer. Um, so, you know, seeing it is, it's, yeah, it's very staggering the, yeah, the kind of wider freedoms that we just take for granted. And it's very sobering. I just wanted to bring Tara back into the conversation around the yeah those those freedoms that we take for granted. You obviously understand, and much of your research is understanding people who do not 
enjoy these same freedoms as we do in the film. So I just wanted to pick that point up with you. Yes, as I, as I was mentioning, um, uh, um, the culture is evolving. Um, th there is even conversation about how this culture is evolving, but it's happening in the absence of legal protection. Uh, one thing that is actually now commonly referred to in Iranian media is the concept of white marriage. Um, it's being discussed at the policy level with people opposing it or ones who are trying to um, suggest that accepting the reality uh, is, is the way to go. Um, and what they mean by white marriage is just two people deciding to live together without going through the official process. Um, but, um, and again, as, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, where you are in the society, who you are and who you are surrounded with can really impact your experience. Um, um, as particularly as a woman, particularly as a as 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 a um, um, as a sexual minority, that that can really uh, impact you as a person. If you have parents, for example, who are accepting you and allowing you to have that life, um, they can also act as. Uh, those who can shield you from authorities. But then at times they can be the ones who would increase the risk of you being targeted. Um, so it's much more complicated to find out who you are and how you want to live when you have these layers and, and layers of barriers. And, and again, how this um, private aspect of your life can become your most vulnerable point in the society in terms of seeking a profession, in terms of being a public figure of any kind, in terms of um, trying to climb up the social and political ladder in it, or even economic ladder in that form. Um, but I also want to draw the attention to what Leila mentioned about Um, and because in so many instances we speak about refugees as numbers, as policies, as what should be the evidentiary standard of, of finding someone's claim credible or not. Um, and we tend to forget that no one leaves where they are in their community if there is not specific, like if there is not a need to do that. And how difficult this journey is by itself and how much more difficult it has become as a result of policies in Europe and in the United States, for example. It's Europe, we, we talk a lot about refugee crisis in Europe. Um, we, I don't know how much we talk in Europe about the fact that the US has also significantly decreased the amount of, um, amount of um, the quota of um, accepting refugees under, under Trump administration. That basically means people like Leila um, and Sahan and others, and, and, and a bigger part of the L LGBTQ community in Turkey are waiting. Um, and their faith is being decided by the US election and, and the talks and, and, and the EU. So I think it's what I particularly liked about the movie is that it connects these two. It connects the difficulties at home um, with the continuing continuous difficulty of embarking on this journey. Um, and I think um, adjusting to some of these things will take time even when you land in a, in a safe, quote unquote, safe or third country. Um, but I think we tend to forget that um, the immediate danger might, might be further when you're not in Iran, but the difficulty of living at, as a refugee continues. Yeah. And I, yeah. that that was one thing when I when I watched the movie that's that's that what really got me because I do work on those all those people who can't uh, seek justice in Iran and how they are being repressed. Uh, but what is less discussed as we talk about Iran or the need of people to live is that how difficult this this is this can be this journey can be even if you choose to leave and you choose to change the situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, can I say something? Sure. Yeah, because I, I think it's, it's super relevant to talk about Iran, but I also think it's super relevant to point the finger at ourselves, uh, at the international community, for not 
being creating um, um, a system that works, and it, it, it's not the the failure of the UN because it's, I think it's a much bigger failure of many many countries who have not uh, found a way to um, to distribute responsibility for this crisis among them, and it, it's so easy for populistic politicians in various countries to just kind of. Uh, point their finger at the refugees and say we don't want to use money and we don't want to take any responsibility. In Europe it's basically mostly uh, Sweden and Germany who has been responsible in this uh, field. So I think we need to look upon uh, what Leila and Sahan meets when they enter the free world and they think they come to, uh, they come out of a kind of a tyranny and then they come into this world where we should be um, humanistic and they come to the UN, the big humanistic uh, organization of this world. And I think we could do better than what, what we are doing today. Uh, it's a faceless, very bureaucratic system that doesn't give these um, uh, people any answers. And if they get an answer, it's uh, mostly after a very, very long time of waiting in kind of the unknown. Yeah. Leila, can we pick that point up with you? Can you ca bring us up to date? So you've been in Turkey now for nine years. Is Does it feel like home? I mean, that's a big point that the film makes us think about and feel the, the importance of home and the necessity of belonging. And it must feel very difficult. At, at where, where are you? Where are you at now? Uh, you know, I am still in the same house that I uh, entered from the beginning. I had a very, very nice uh, man, very nice woman, well, very nice, very kind man was my, my neighbor that I missed him too. Uh, he passed away uh, some months ago and it was uh, something very painful for me. It was something like a dad for me. And, you know, uh, here in Turkey, the people are very kind as my country. The people in my country also the same. I accept Taras, whatever Tara said. Uh, but in Iran, if I had a chance to share my story with my friends, with my relatives, maybe uh, I don't say yes, all of them ag could accept it. But people at least has a, some kind of potential to digest their each other's problem. But the judiciary system, no. Judiciary system. Uh, block you and don't let you to go ahead. And, and if I wanted to stay in Iran, my child didn't, want, uh, didn't have any kind of validity, any kind of uh, any ID. And here in Turkey, uh, yes, I have many good friends. Now I de we establish our uh, a small society. We're dealing with our friends. We invited them. They invited us to their party, to their uh, uh, homes and uh, their events, but the problem is that uh, I call it, it uh, unsafe because you know, I said I don't have any right here still. I'm not a citizen of here. All for me. Sometimes I speak with my friends, and still they say that okay. You mean that if some someday a country choose you to give you the support of being a refugee, you're gonna still take your suitcase and go there, go there to start again from the zero? My answer is very simple. Yes, because of what? Just because of the uh, safety that country can give me here, because of the right of being a citizen. Because here I don't go to the court. I don't even I couldn't change my the surname of my uh, son. I they don't look at us as a citizen. And uh, I mean, I just want the obvious and undeniable right of being as a citizen. Not very much. I don't want any country to support me economically, to support me, uh, to find me the job. No, nothing. I, they came out just for having a simple life with each other in somewhere that accept us as a citizen. But because of that, uh, we love Turkey. My son uh, has, a, has spent his childhood here. And sometimes even my husband said that money, if uh, money will fall in love with a Turkish girl in the future, wherever that we go, because he has spent all his good memories and childhood with, because he was small, he didn't understand what happened to him. We try to make the atmosphere nice for him with the small things we try to uh, grow him 
say uh, healthy as a health, uh, mentally healthy and then because of that yes i want to belong myself to this country but i still can't because i have no right and they don't observe us as a, they call us stateless and this uh, world has a many many burden eva can i bring you in there really to pick up on that because obviously the film um you know describes a lot of that experience but it do, and and so in a, in a way also it's a document for Manny at some point perhaps of the journey that his parents have taken so the film has lots of legacies and I just wanted to ask you how that feels and how much was you intended and how much is kind of surprising to you I mean, the, the nature of documentary filmmaking is kind of you you bet on some people and you see what life does to them. It can sound a bit cynical, but um, that I also think in that it, it, there's an openness to what can what does life bring um, and 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 a curiosity to see um, what is happening. Um, and I think for us, it was. Uh, uh, we, we were also surprised. I mean, in the beginning, we thought we could uh, follow Leila and Sahan for a few years and then they would be repatriated in some country and we could maybe end the film there and kind of close it uh, with, a, with a new beginning somewhere. Um, and, I mean, life does different things than we, you expected. And in this case, I was so surprised that, they, that the, the free world would not accept this couple as... Um, as a family, that all the, the the you come out to unite, as they tell they tell us so beautifully in the film, and then uh, they are separate. They are in in threat of being separated again. And um, yeah, I think that there was so many uh, surprises and twists and turns that you can look back upon. That is good for the film, but it was so tough for Leila and Sahan and Mani to. Uh, to kind of have to live through all of this uh, and have no strength, uh, and they just had to to um, give in to their destiny. They had nothing to fight with. They couldn't ask anybody why is this the case. And they were so good at reading, uh, writing in English. Uh, they were very good at managing a very problematic situation. And I guess if they were less skillful, it would have been much worse for them. Um, so that I think. Uh, we could do better, uh, and and that uh, that kind of of, of uh, I know it's difficult to to treat everyone, uh, and there has been so many refugees coming these years, but still it doesn't seem um, like a healthy system that we have built. Leila, there are a couple of questions for you. So one is from Saman Glover. Um, happy fortieth birthday to you, from Thank all of us. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing this part of your life with us. And thank you, Eva, for making it possible. I felt your fear and frustration as you awaited your fate. If you could change one thing about this bureaucratic system, what would you change? And what, would, what advice would you give to others who are also in the same position as you, but maybe not as advanced? Uh, you know, uh, in Iran, uh, Tara knows better that which uh, condition is uh, ruling in Iran. And even in, under that situation, we have a very, very brave woman and man who really fight with that uh, difficulties. They go to the prison, they going to bring some kind of reforms to the society to save the lives, to bring the hope to the society. And you are living in a very developed countries with the basic, you know the rights, you know you speak about, you have a many nice photos about the human rights. Uh, you have the chance to vote, you have the chance to elect, you have the chance to choose uh, one who can support, who can at least give a hand to those who are in the need. Please try to choose those ones who understand the situation, the difficulties of the refugee. Like the other people, like all the members of the society that we have a good people and the bad people. I even cannot say bad people. I say that they are in a very bad, uh, they are in a very poor situation to grasp the better uh, opportunity. Like them, between the uh, refugee, they have, a, they have a one 
who can adapt himself and uh, who can deserve to be in a, uh, in a free society and uh, just try to differentiate them, differentiate them, yes. And uh, what else? You can look at our case like a case study, like a research that where is that? Where does the, where something doesn't work properly? What is the problem? That even by proving, even by showing the DNA uh, test, still they consider our cases as a two, not as a one case from UNSCR. You know, even it's uh, funny for my friends, they say that, uh, one of my friends know my story and she said that but you uh, delivered the dna test i say yes even by dna test they don't accept you know it's something very odd it shocked me how how much i should scream they are close their eyes in their ears but can I say a quotation? I love this quotation very much, and I like to share with all. Uh, after reading this quotation, I said to myself, "Yes, it's your, uh, it's your responsibility to continue." <laughs> a scream so that one day, a hundred years from now, another sister will not have to dry her tears, wondering where in history she lost her voice. I love it. Mm, yeah, that's lovely. That's very precious. Thank you, Layla. Um, Tara, can I bring you in before I ask actually, Layla, another question from the audience, um, which is, I mean, how wh how might you use this film in the work that you do? I mean, what what kind of value do films like this have for you, in for for people in the in the area of research and um, development that you cover? I mean, this film has two parts. I think has the difficulty of um, um, living as a woman who doesn't um, in Iran, which is very valuable for us to humanize the story. We hear a lot of stories uh, from Iran and people who challenge authorities, but uh, movies allow you to 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 get connected. You can read. You can open major papers and read a story about human rights violation in Iran every other day. Um, but I think I've always really enjoyed this um, component of our work that we try to bring movies because I think movie allows you to see the story as a whole. Um, you, you allows you to see how difficult it is for Leila and Sahan to go through, but then how joyful it is when they have those shared moments. And I think it connects you to the story that we all live moments of difficulties and joy at the same time and push through. I think it encourages people to have a deeper understanding of the situation and also works even better for policymakers to some extent. And the second part of the movie is the refugee story and how difficult and frustrating it has been for people like um, Leila and Tan to get, um, to get the protection they need and they deserve and how um, in both of those contexts, we have problems of people being diminished to numbers and, and stories and, and just snapshot of the story. Um, so I think on both fronts, we're hoping that um, that when people watch this movie, um, they can understand the enormous amount of um, effort and resilience that people who go through these difficult moments have. Um, and understand the value of advocating for policy change. It, at times that we are bombarded by news, by headlines, everything feels so grim. Um, it's easy to feel disappointed and feel powerless and feel that it's all out of your hand and you can't change things. But I think these stories allow us to, to also make the case to the public that why, why we should be pushing for change, why we do what we do, because there are real people who alongside us or in many situations ahead of us are pushing through with their resilience. And, mm -hmm. and so supporting um, the human rights movement as a whole, uh, a war, like, and, I, and I emphasize on the part as a whole because these stories are connected. Um, we have, that you might be interested in one part of the, the world and not the other, but ultimately I, I think if anything, um, 
living through COVID over the past year shows us that we can only move forward at, as a whole. If we believe in these progressive values, if we believe in a world better for all, we have to start seeing the interconnectivity of these stories, how a policy in the US impacts the lives of someone in Iran versus how um, Europe and US relationship might impact it. So we can only move forward as a whole. And I think we shouldn't shy away from um, nuance, complexity, and seeing people as a combination of difficult and joyful moment. I think that allows us to have hope that things will change. If we only see the negative part, and this is what we do, we all, we're always bringing out sad, sad stories, we're always telling you how policy is wrong, how government is repressive, it can, it can make people feel grim, but I hope with these movies and stories, we can make the case that why this is necessary and why it is possible to move forward. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you, Tara. A woman to that, um, and yeah, again, that's why this film is so significant, and and for for many years to come, I think as well. Um, so there's a question for I think actually it should be for Leila and Eva before we actually wrap. Maybe last question. Thank. So this is from Leah Sapin. Uh, thank you so much for openness and bravery sharing your family's lives in the film, Leila. I can imagine you must have a range of feelings about this, but it must have been difficult to watch the finished film. I actually want to ask Eva this question first and then Leila, because Eva, the deciding when and what to show and how to show it must have been very complicated. So just talk us through the kind of complexities of that and how you manage that, because that's a big, difficult thing to hold. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird business uh, making documentary films. In a way, um, uh, you borrow somebody's life and then you pick those small parts that you can use for for a good story uh, that is um, emotionally touching for an audience. But it's not always fair to the reality. There are a lot of, of things and story pieces and bits in Leila and Sahan's life that are super relevant that we couldn't put into the film. Um, and I'm lucky I work with a very good editor, so um, in, in that way I have to protect, uh, and me and the editor, we have to protect uh, the story uh, so that we don't put so much into it, so that, it's on the, this, uh, that it doesn't work for, for the audience. But that negotiation between taking the right uh, decisions for the story uh, is not necessarily always um, the same as the right choices for the participants. Um, so for me as a, a filmmaker, uh, it's always a very um, emotional time when I have to screen what, what kind of choices we have made with that uh, very, um, like it's a gift that these people give you, that allow you to, to document their life and then you have to be super, um, um, you have to listen very carefully to what they say about the choices you have made. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you can actually change something, and other times you have to uh, defend your choices. Um, and I think Leila, you, she could tell you more. We we did have discussions about the choices that we made in this film, and Leila and Sahan are not uh, super happy about some of the things that we didn't show that they wanted in the film. Uh, but the day that we screened the film, we also had the feeling that that there was also a strong film here uh, that they could see themselves in and that they could also see the beauty in. Um, and I think that they are um, kind of, they have a very clear understanding um, of the artistic choices. What we have been discussing is a more political part of the story that would have been nice for them to have, have been able to share in this film. Leila, how was it to watch for the first time and then how was it to watch with an audience? Uh, yes, uh, when uh, Eva came to us to show that, uh, to screen the film for us, uh, you know, that day, just once I watched my film, our film, and I couldn't watch it again. Uh, the trailer, even she, when she showed us the trailer, Two or three times we watched a trailer just with the hand, and each time we cried a lot. Mm -hmm. And after watching the whole film, we just at the end of the film we just were in numb and looked at the we gazed a stare to the screen and couldn't speak for some minutes. It was 
you know, you see, when you uh, look back, you say that how I came out safely from that storm. But uh, one of the other things, when the film finished and the camera switched off, I said, okay, the other journey has started. Now I'm going to fight again with the other things, with the other uh, reflections that going to come from who watch, who going to watch the film and who going to say here their point of view. And, uh, you know, the film, me and Sahan believe that, yes, Eva was a great director. She, she knew her job very well. And uh, she could uh, show and pick the very artistic ones. But we believe that, yes, the film was a very short part of our life here in this uh, five or six years. And uh, our case is complicated and it really needs to investigate journals. And uh, oh, my, co my uh, husband called it as a Kafka like situation that we are that we are trapped in it and you know let's just let's, yes it's also another thing Leila is that we haven't been able to show um, your film in a cinema with an audience to you and normally um, we, we premiered the film in a, a beautiful big festival in Canada uh, TIFF Toronto International Film Festival and it was such a once again, uh, you see the, the, the limitations of the refugee life because we wanted to invite you there uh, to have that experience of the world premiere and this beautiful setting. And Leila's dream destination in her life is Canada. So, I mean, I can't give you uh, a citizenship in Canada, but I could have brought you to this festival to kind of wrap uh, you, that in a way. But uh, yeah. as it is now, uh, as a refugee, you're not allowed to leave uh, Turkey. And uh, we have not been able to bring you to any of the festivals that this film actually has been going to uh, before the COVID uh, closed down. And I haven't been able to come back to Turkey, which was plan B, to, uh, to show you the film in the cinema with an audience there. Uh, so right now, it's just... How many times in your life do you participate in a documentary film like that? And you are once again deprived from actually uh, the experience that could have been there for you uh, if you had had a normal citizenship and normal rights. Yes, Eva, uh, what, sometimes, you know, passing the time, one of the disadvantages of passing the time is that, that you start to forget some part, what happened to you. And uh, sometimes Sahand, uh, Sahand looked at the situation, sometimes very suspicious, and she said, she said, he said that, yes, they took us here just to, uh, just uh, that we forget what happened to us, but intentionally, they keep, uh, they keep us here to, uh, we start to forgetting what happened for me, for us during these years, uh, we have the, uh, what, the, what they wanted to be, that we be, oopsie, my goodness. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to say something that I forget. Wait, please. Yes, you couldn't imagine that how we were happy that day to go to the Canada, uh, Canadian uh, embassy to get the invitation, to show them the invitation, to get the visa, to try our chance to go to the Canada and be among the audiences. We didn't want to escape from Turkey. We expect to the rules of the UNHCR. We just wanted to go there and come back again. But even they don't let us to go, not Canada, even the nearest country of uh, Turkey, even the Greece, that is a neighbor of uh, Turkey. And, you know, that day my son asked me, okay, if I'm going to continue my education somewhere, it means that I can't go? And I have no answer for him. He's growing up and, uh, you know, as a mom or as a, a parent, when you can't find the answer for your child, it's a kind of shame for you. Oh God, Leila, yeah, I feel that pain very strongly. What, I mean, how, we, we need to wrap, but I feel like Tara, maybe, what what can we do about a situation like that? What, what 
I'm sure lots of people feel the same way I feel, where I feel powerless to do something and I want to know what I can do. What advice would you offer? Like, what can people seeing this film, what, listening to this conversation, who, who are not in the situation that Layla's in, what can any of us do to support? That's the hardest part. I think you could do a lot, I mean, you could, you could advocate for changing the policies that are preventing Layla um, and her family to, to proceed with their lives. Um, and you could support the organizations that are working to um, change the situation um, in, different, in different parts of the world. And I think most importantly, um, you could continue spreading this message um, and raising awareness and, and pushing back on the public narrative um, that, um, that discounts this, this experience. I think if as the general public, we, we try to do these three to the extent that we can, uh, we can make a difference collectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Eva, I'd like to give the last word to you. Um, uh, anything to add to that in in how you're using the film as a kind of campaigning tool? Well, I hope that uh, simple storytelling, good storytelling, can actually uh, create um, a more humanistic uh, approach to the refugee issue. And in in the end, I mean, we need to, I think, believe in the power of of uh, stories and in the power of people. And so if you've seen a film and you, you felt uh, that uh, Leila and Sahan should be supported, then vote for politicians next time who are not uh, making like a domestic agenda where they try to use people like Leila and Sahan, refugees, uh, to kind of make a front against them and to, to promote their own uh, issues. So I think that is, is doable for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So for those of you who haven't seen the film and who are tuning in from the UK, um, you can see the film on the Barbican player um, or you can see the film on um, modernfilms.com um, forward slash love child. The film was going to be in cinemas as well, but of course they're closed, but they will reopen on December the 3rd in the UK. And so please go and see it in the cinema. It will come back. Um, or if you want need to see it soon, see it online. And um, so thank you to Republic. Um, for releasing the film in the UK and to the Barbican and Human Rights Watch for partnering on this event. And more importantly, Layla, wishing you every good fortune to you and your family um, for finding a state and that it happens soon. And thank you so much for sharing your life now and also your life on screen. Really, it's a very powerful, powerful thing that you've done. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I really beg a pardon that if I had, I had many, if no, I had many mistakes in my words and in my grammar too. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't. We understood you perfectly. Tara, thank you so much for your great insights. And Eva, thank you so much for yours too and for your very powerful filmmaking. And yeah, thank you for sharing all of this with us. Good night. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you Pleasure. for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.